Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the creation of the internet. And the way something is created helps determine how it behaves. The way it was birthed, the heritage and breeding, determines what type of impact it has. That's one of the lessons we're trying to explore in this class, which is how the history of something shapes the way it impacts the present. And there's nothing more than the internet that shows us, because the internet was created collaboratively and ingrained into it DNA is this concept of collaboration. It was built in a way that prevents centralized gatekeepers, it prevents hierarchy, it allows every node of the internet equal power to store and forward and create and receive content. And that notion of ending gatekeepers, flattening hierarchies, that's hallmarks. Those are hallmarks of the digital revolution, largely because of the way the internet came to be. The internet is a packet switch network. What does that mean? Well, there are many ways you can send information across a network. One of them is like the phone company has, which is a circuit switch network. If you make a phone call to somebody else, they're switching stations and central hubs along the route, and they take you know, the call you make and they do a little circuit. And it, there it is, it's a dedicated circuit from one phone to the other. And by dedicated, I mean it's dedicated to just that circuit, to just that conversation, and nobody else can be sending information across that particular circuit that's dedicated for the conversation. Now that makes for very reliable circuits, very reliable network, but it also is a great waste of bandwidth because a whole lot of time when you're on the phone, there's pauses, you're not sending information, a lot more information would be going through those wires, but those wires or that circuit at least is dedicated to you. The other way of doing things is called a packet switch network. And that's where if you want to send information from one computer to another or one server to another or even from a phone to another and you're using a packet switch network, instead of there being a dedicated circuit, the information uh, that's being sent is whether it's a movie with a whole lot of kilobytes or just some email that's pretty simple, it's broken into packets and there are all sorts of nodes along the way. And one of the packets may scurry here and get to the computer this way. But if this is kind of clogged up, the next packet might say, here's the faster way to go. And those get clogged up. There's just different ways. They can all scurry through the network to get to their destination. And nothing ever clogs. There's no bottleneck. And by the way, if you knock out one of the nodes, which is somebody blows one of them up, then a packet switch network can just write around that node because every node is equally uh, able to store and forward information. One way to think it through is imagine a Mardi Gras parade. Mardi Gras parade has lots of floats lined up and lots of bands lined up. And it follows a particular line, a particular circuit, you know, St. Charles Avenue to Canal, back to Exposition Boulevard, whatever it may be. And if in, in the, it can only go as fast as the slowest float or the slowest band. If anything slows down, the whole process slows down. And especially if you've got a couple of parades going, if Rex is going up St. Charles Avenue and Zulu's coming down Jackson Avenue, is gonna to try to turn on the St. Charles Avenue, then Rex has to wait until Zulu finishes its use of the circuit before Rex can go. And that's not very efficient, especially as often happens in Mardi Gras parades, one of the floats breaks down or one of the bands stops to play and everything behind it has to stop. A more efficient way to do it would be, it wouldn't be as much fun, maybe it would be as much fun, who knows, we should try it, is every float has an address header on it. It knows if you're a float that you're supposed to end right here next to Congo Square. And if you're another float, you're gonna end right here in the middle of the French Quarter on uh, Royal and Burgundy, or Bourbon and Burgundy Street. And you just start marching along, but every float and every marcher and every band knows that that's the address they're supposed to go to. And as they start going along the route and say St. Anne's Street is blocked off of construction, as it often is, 
one of the floats can go up Dauphine, then Ursuline, come back down Rampart. And if that gets clogged up, another float can go this way. They can all find, they can all scurry along different routes, but they know the address they're supposed to end up at, and they know the order they're supposed to reassemble themselves. And so, boom, that would take about one tenth of the time if you could just have every float take the easiest route to get to the final destination and then reassemble when it got there. So that's what a guy named Paul Doran figures out. He's at Rand Corporation in the 1950s, which is a research and development corporation working for the Air Force, among other things, in Santa Monica. And the Russians have just tested a bomb, a hydrogen bomb is just coming to existence. And he's worried that once you have a nuclear standoff between Russia and the United States, each, each country uh, will be worried about, what if I get attacked and my communication system goes out? Then it'll be a disaster, then I can't retaliate. And so that puts both sides on hair trigger alert. It means that if you think you're gonna be attacked, you're on a hair trigger, you might preemptively attack back just because you wanna make sure that you don't have your communication systems destroyed. And so he comes up with the notion of using packet switching to make a very simple uh, uh, communication system where if you destroy one of the nodes or a bomb hits one of the nodes, it's not like hitting a central hub or even like airlines have where there's spokes going to five or six hubs in the country. You knock out these hubs, the whole system and network goes down. But here, even if you knock out many of the nodes, things, uh, messages can still route around them. And so that was his notion of having each node be able to store and forward information. And he came up with the notion of breaking information and messages and communications into very small uh, packets of about 1,024 bits. That's really small, about two thirds of that's for the message, the rest is for the address header and other instructions it's supposed to do if it gets lost, those type of things. And you break up everything into these tiny packets, another, and he takes it to the phone company and says, here's a better way, because the phone company, AT&T, the Bell system, has circuit switching. He says, no, go to packet switching. It'll make everything safer. Over and over again, 94 meetings, and they keep explaining to him why that will never, ever, ever work. And finally, when they explain it to him for the 94th time and say, do you understand why it'll never work? Paul Barron says, no. But eventually, not because of Paul Barron, eventually because of other people, including Donald Davies in England who came up with the name packet for these information little packages that like story forth and Leonard Kleinrock at UCLA who was part of the original uh, ARPANET. They and others, Bob Roberts, uh, Bob Taylor, uh, uh, help create an internet. And what they do is they're doing it in order to have research universities timeshare their computers. As I said in an earlier lecture, some places like the University of Utah had really great computers funded by the government that did graphics very well. Others like at UCLA had a really great computer that did databases. Another might be really good at heavy number crunching. Instead of having each university want to have all different types of computers, they decided it would be easy, easier to create a network where they could share their computers. And that becomes the ARPANET, and they do it through packet switching. And then they tell the universities, the research professors, to figure out how to connect to it. And the research professors do what research professors often do. They assign the task to their graduate students. Two of the graduate students are here, others when they got a little bit older, that on the left, is Steve Crocker there with a beard, he still has one, is Vent Cerf. And they helped to create the different ways to make sure that the connections were made across the internet. Uh, Steve Crocker was the youngest and he was assigned to write up what they had decided, but he wanted to make sure that ingrained in the DNA of this network was collaboration rather than top-down authority. That was already part of it because every node had decentralized uh, distributed power. But still, he was a great believer. This is the 1960s. They were all 
avoiding the draft. They didn't like top-down authority. And so they come up with a way to have rules for it, but not call them rules. What Steve Crocker calls them is requests for comment. And that becomes a way they get the standards for doing the internet and making everybody feel that they collaborated in it rather than it was handed down from on high. It's amazing that that's the way they could do the internet with RFC1, RFC2, explaining how to put address headers on, how to recombine if one packet doesn't arrive, all those sort of things. But what's amazing to me is that's still the way the internet is being done. We're up to the RFC, I think, you know, 8100 or so. We're still building the internet collaboratively and designing it. And that becomes part of the system of what it is. It was totally open sourced. And so by doing it, it allowed it to grow spectacularly and they created the process. On October 29th, 1969 at UCLA with Leonard Kleinrock's lab, Vent Surf and Steve Crocker overseeing it, a scruffy graduate student, you can see him putting on headsets, He's the person who's going to try to use what was then called ARPANET for the very first time, ARPANET for the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Pentagon that was funding it. And he's going to try to send a message to Stanford. And he types in login. He types in the L. And the person on the phone up at Stanford says, I got the L. It's working. Then he types in the O. He says, I got the O. It's working. He's about to type G. And it stops working because the machine was trying to autofill something. But... So the first message over what we now call the internet was just low, L-O. It's not quite as exciting as the eagle has landed or some other great messages, but in some way it was cool, low, as in lo and behold, we now have an internet. That was at the end of 1969. 69 was a really weird, horrible year in many ways. It's like 2020. Uh, it had things like Woodstock and Chappaquiddick were Ted Kennedy drew, drove off a bridge. The biggest of the anti-Vietnam War protests, the Rolling Stones murderous concert, Altamont happened, uh, Chicago 8 trial. But three big things happened at the end of that year. Number one, we sent a man to the moon and returned him safely. Secondly, the ARPANET was created. And thirdly, the microprocessor, Intel, is able to etch on a silicon chip all you need for a processor, for a central processing unit for a computer. Of those three things, only the man on the moon makes headlines. And arguably, or I would argue, that might have been the least important of the three compared to the launch of what is now the internet and the creation of the microprocessor. The ARPANET wasn't actually the internet yet because other people had networks that were packet switch as well. So Vince Cerf, the guy with the scruffy beard, and another one of the former graduate students, Bob Kahn, come up with a way to interconnect the various networks. If you want to send something from one network to the other, there's just a specific way to have a destination address called an internet protocol. And then they came up with TCP, which is the Transmission Control Protocol. It's like having an envelope and instructions to send data from one network to the other. Then TCP IP, those are the internet pro protocols. They were used to bring all these networks together, led by ARPANET, the one we talked about from the Defense Department, and it was called internetworking, or later just the internet. The flaws that ended up being in the system for example, encoded in every packet is the address header, where it's supposed to go. But you don't have deeply encoded into each packet where it came from. You never could try, quite trace back to all those nodes. In fact, you can hide where something comes from. There's anonymity on the net, and that has its advantages. But it does mean that people scamming you. There's the Internet Research Agency in Russia trying to send fake news to the United States. There are people telling you they've lost their wallet in Ghana and they're your cousin and you need to wire them money. There are people doing all sorts of trolling and faking and scamming and bullying things and they can do it anonymously. We could have invented an internet in which not only do you know where the packets are going, but you have encoded into them where they came from. Just like in the phone system, you can have 
in the old movies, trace that phone call, and the phone company can tell you where the phone call came from. And because you can't trace back the data and you can't trace back who's going to your internet site and getting things from you, it's hard to have a system where people can get paid for the things they put online automatically, where it can just be sort of a royalty system. There's a lot of ways that if we had not had uh, the simple address headers and we had had better protocols, so you could know who was coming to your site on the internet and also where everybody was coming from, it may have been better. It's a bit too late to fix it, although Bob Kahn, Bent Surf, and Tim Berners-Lee are thinking of ways to see if they can make it better. There's always been a debate of whether it was nuke-related. And, um, you know, people say, as Paul Baran did when he did packet switching, I'm doing it in case we have to fight a nuclear war, we can uh, help communication systems survive. You talk to the graduate students, uh, you know, like Vince Ruff and Bob Kahn, they say, no, that's not why we invented the internet. That's not why we were building the thing. We were graduate students in the 1960s. Think about it for a second. Why were we graduate students? Because we were avoiding the draft. We weren't trying to do things to help the Pentagon fight a war. Uh, Bob Taylor, who was one of the people there, said they were just merely creating um, time sharing. And they said, uh, he sent a letter to Time Magazine. I was working there. We didn't publish it because we said we had a better source. I went back later and checked and found out that the better source was a guy named Stephen Lukasich, who actually was at the Pentagon with the budget funding all of this. And he said, yeah, I wouldn't have plowed a lot of money into a network just to improve the productivity of researchers. We were doing it to fight a nuclear war. He wrote a paper saying, despite what all these, you know, we didn't tell the graduate students that, they were all draft dodgers. The Lucagius wrote a paper saying, we were on top, you know, we, we did this and we didn't tell you graduate students why we were doing it, but we were doing it to help fight a nuclear war. And Lukasich said to me, I was on the, he said to Lukasich, uh, Lukasich said to Steve Crocker, and to the other graduate students, I was on the top and you were on the bottom. So you really had no idea what was going on. And Lukasich, when I told him about that, he stroked his chin when we were at a coffee shop and he replied uh, with a dollop of uh, wisdom and some humor. He said, you tell Steve Lucasic, I was on the bottom and he was on the top. So he's the one who didn't know what was happening. And that was funny, but it's also the essence of the internet. It's no longer a top-down system. The people at a high part of the hierarchy, they no longer can control what goes on. If you're at the bottom, if you're one of the nodes, you have just as much control. And that's ingrained into the DNA of the internet. That's why the digital revolution is so based on getting rid of gatekeepers, getting rid of hierarchy, flattening corporate structures and org charts, and making pure peer-to-peer -peer collaboration be the name of the game in the digital revolution. Oh, and just one more thing. Uh, Al Gore used to get in trouble. When I was writing my book, The Innovators, Al Gore, people said to me, oh yeah, you're writing about who invented the internet? You mean Al Gore? And then they laugh, ha ha ha. Because Al Gore had once said during my service in the US Congress, I took the initiative in creating the internet. And people thought it was typical of Al Gore. He was taking credit for the internet. He didn't really say that. But more importantly, he did do something important because you know, when I was in college, when I was in the 1980s, a normal person couldn't just get on the internet. You had to be at a research institution, a university, a government office in order to have access, to be able to dial into the internet. But Al Gore in 1991, there's the Gore Act of 91, then another follow-up telecommunication, telecommunications act of 92, then when he's vice president in 93, fixes it up so that anybody can dial up and get onto the internet. Not only .edu or .gov, but they create a .com where you can create internet access services and anybody is able to get on in the internet and by the way, create things, buy things, sell things, create businesses on the internet. He opened up the internet to the public. So that's how we got the internet we have today. Thanks.